Okay, it's, it's 12.30, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, and uh, we thank you for joining us. My name is Ethan Hunt, and I'm the current um, Michael and Susan Dell uh, Center Postdoctoral Fellow. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by the Michael and Susan Dell Center for, for Healthy Living at the UT School of Public Health in Austin, Texas. So before we get started with our presenters, uh, I just wanna make a couple housekeeping announcements for the attendees. Uh, first, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived along with the presentation slides on the Michael and Susan uh, Dell Center at msdcenter.org. And second, if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them into the question chat box and we will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So before I introduce our current talk, our current speakers, Dr. Brazendale and Dr. Leanne Ganser, we have one slide that we would like to show uh, regarding sleep uh, in Texas youth here uh, in, in and around Texas. So this data is from our Texas SPAN study, which is the Texas School Physical Activity and Nutrition Study, which is a representative study of the of health and wellness variables and metrics of uh, children around Texas. So the figure on the right uh, simply shows couple categories of sleep, uh, ranging from less than six hours to 10 or more uh, sleep hours, self-reported uh, sleep hours, and both in all second, fourth, and eighth, and 11th graders in the state of Texas. And to just highlight um, a couple of, of points here, I know Dr. Brazendale and uh, Dr. Ganser both work with uh, some sleep metrics in children and youth. Uh, so firstly, to highlight our, a sleep crisis here in the state of Texas. In second graders, 31% of our Hispanic and 30% of our African American uh, children do not have a regular bedtime during the school week, compared to only 19% uh, of children from white or other uh, ethnicity. Uh, secondly, only 57% of our Texas border students meet sleep recommendations compared to 70% of our non-border second grade uh, students here in Texas. However, 33% of our 11th grade Texas border students meet sleep recommendations compared to 23% of non-border 11th graders. And, and finally, 54% of second graders have electronic devices in their bedrooms compared to more than 90% of our 11th graders here in the state of Texas. So we wanted to quickly show this from our recent Texas SPAN data to highlight sleep disparities as well as a sleep crisis here with our, our children and youth in the state of Texas. So I'm excited to introduce our speakers today, Drs. Leanne Ganser and Keith Brazendale. Keith Brazendale is currently the assistant, an assistant professor in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of Central Florida. Dr. Brazendale earned his PhD in 2017 from the Department of Exercise Science in the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, where I also earned my PhD last year. Dr. Brazendale's research interest centers on childhood obesity prevention and treatment, specifically obesogenic behaviors such as physical activity, sleep, screen time and diet of children in and out of school time. Dr. Brazendale developed the structured data hypothesis to help researchers understand the occurrence of accelerated weight gain during times when children have less structure to their day-to-day -day lives, such as summer vacation during uh, the summer months. Dr. Leanne Ganser is a postdoctoral research fellow at the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin, where her research focuses on built environment uh, built environment influences on physical activity and serves as a measurement coordinator for the safe travel environmental evaluation in Texas schools or the street study. She completed her doctor of PH in health promotion and behavioral sciences from UT Health and her master of public health degree in community health education from Baylor University. In between graduate programs, she was a Fulbright scholar and worked in nonprofits and local health departments on physical activity promotion. So I will now hand it over to Keith and Leanne to start the pre presentation titled, The Impact of COVID-19 on Children's Obesogenic Behaviors. Thank you uh, very much, Ethan, and, and welcome everyone today. Good morning to those in Texas and, and in the other time zones. It's, it's afternoon with us, so good afternoon to my East, East Coast time folks. And uh, as Ethan had mentioned in his introduction, what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today is uh, how the COVID-19 pandemic really highlighted the importance of structure when addressing childhood obesity, which is my area of research interest. Before I dive into that, I'd like to extend a thank you to the Michael and Susan Dale Center for Healthy Living uh, for the invitation to speak. It's a pleasure. I always like to share my work with other institutions and, and groups. And I can see this is a, a, a very well attended webinar. So 
uh, that's exciting. Um, I'm going to go through my presentation and then, um, you know, we'll pass it over to, to Leanne and she'll go through her talk. And then at the end, we'll have Ethan moderate some questions. Um, so, yeah, let's let's take it away. So, you know, COVID has been no mystery. Um, you know, the sheer impact of it is, has, you know, has been was seen nationally, internationally. But when you actually look at some of the numbers of children that were impacted by some of the measures that we're taking, we were talking over about 1.5 billion children at the, at the, the low end uh, were impacted by schools being closed, programs and, and camps and community cent centers closing, you know, all with the, all sort of unified um, mitigation strategies, you could say, to, to curb the spread of the virus. And this is obviously we're not quite there right now, right? We, but we were at this point and it was quite uh, for a prolonged period of time we we're talking you know, what was only considered to be a few weeks, but that extended to six months and then perhaps 12 months. So this was a significant impact on the day-to-day -day lives of children and families. Um, and what we believe, um, you know, whether we're looking at childhood obesity or health, um, you know, this, this disruption uh, could be seen across multiple domains. You know, if we're talking about uh, infrastructure, if we're talking about trade, right, just everything was completely uh, throwing up in the air, you know, rug pulled from underneath your feet, you know, cat amongst the pigeons. We didn't foresee this coming, right? There were some warning signs, but we never thought it would be that bad, right? And obviously we're still um, in some of the midst of it. But with such a big disruption, right, what was the impact on health? Like, What was the real impact on children's health? And as I mentioned before, I'm a childhood obesity, um, my research centers around that, that's my interest. So I was really keen to look at the literature that was emerging over the last two years. And what we saw was quite alarming, right? Even from a global perspective, I'm not framing this from the US by any means. This was a worldwide uh, epidemic. And, and I've just, you know, took some uh, tidbits out of some of the articles that I've been reviewing over the last 18 months and highlighted some of the, some of the findings that were just really quite um, um, worrying. Right. Um, so obesity prevalence increased. Right. And we saw this in large samples of, of children. This, this isn't, um, you know, small samples of children. That we're, we're talking hundreds of thousands of children from multiple different studies across multiple continents. We saw large gains in weight when compared to similar lengths of time before the pandemic. We saw doubling uh, in monthly increases in BMI during the pandemic. Uh, this one down here at the bottom, the UK. Um, National Child Measurement Program have been operating for 15 years, collecting measurements on children. They saw the largest single year increase since the beginning of this program, observed during the pandemic. Um, some studies found that you know this uh, children who are already overweight and obese and or um, from of elementary school age in, in the UK, it's called primary school children, were most at risk. And then in the treatment literature, we were seeing that you know children who are in treatment programs for weight related issues actually reversed right or erased all the gains they'd made before in a similar period of time and the interesting thing about that study was um session adherence right or um number of sessions attended during the pandemic compared to before the pandemic was equal right so we saw this large increase and in this big impact on children's weight related outcomes on the behavior side which is another area that i'm interested in um we probably had double the amount of articles that looked at obesogenic behaviors. So physical activity, diet, screen time, sleep, um, sedentary time, right? Um, and we saw a complete deterioration. Um, it was pretty, uh, there's a large consensus that children were less active during the pandemic or in the, in the height of the pandemic. Sedentary, uh, sedentary time had, had gone up, screen time had gone up, diets had been impacted, right? And then sleep had been, had, uh, sleep duration had gotten longer. And timing was altered, it was more variable. It shifted later also. So we saw this collective deterioration um, in, in uh, obesogenic behaviors and weight-related outcomes. So seeing this evidence, I was, you know, myself and my colleagues were actually deep in discussion about it. Um, and we were asking ourselves, well, shouldn't we, shouldn't we have anticipated this? Like, knowing what we know in other contexts, is it, should this have you know, been a surprise? Uh, but we did have a lot of other things going on during COVID, so it kind of, you know, catch us off guard. But I would argue that, you know, we should have anticipated this. This is this is no different if we just take a step back and look at the look at other times or contexts when children have their typical day-to-day -day lives somewhat interrupted 
the schedule and routine is, uh, you could say, stalled, right, or, or reduced. Um, and I'm talking about when they go on vacation, right, school holidays. We have some literature out of Australia. Weekend versus weekdays. The weekends is just a, is a, is a two-day uh, period of time where it's not the same as a school day or a school weekday. Uh, and then we have summer. In the US here, it's a long summer. In the UK, it's about half the time, six weeks. And then another continent summer break is, is, is variable too. But these are all classic times when children are removed from this consistency and routine that's built in when they have a more structured day that's usually defined by attending school, right? That's the most common example. And this was somewhat forecasted, you could say, by the structured days hypothesis, which was, uh, you know, put out there in 2017 as a way to explain what was going on when children were in school versus summer, like school months versus summer months. Why are we seeing this accelerated weight gain over summer months, but during school there was a large amount of convincing evidence that weight gain over nine months was relatively stable or just above normal growth, but we saw this acceleration over summer. So that's why the, the structured days hypothesis was developed and basically it, it suggested that our, the children's behaviors are more favorable when they have more structure and routine in their lives. And over summer months, that's not necessarily guaranteed. It's more or less structured time. So what caught my eye, obviously, um, this was part of my dissertation work, as I said back in 2017, was the amount of attention that this uh, hypothesis got during COVID. Um, citations went through the roof, um, which was telling me that the scientific community was really looking at this as a, a potential framework to help explain what was going on, that, that what was coming out of the literature, right? Children were moved from their day-to-day -day routine and structure, much like what happens during summer. And, you know, this has had a negative impact on the behaviors, and that is probably manifesting in weight gain. Um, so the structured days hypothesis is, 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 you know, assumed quite a degree of relevancy during COVID. So what is it about a structured day that makes it inherent, you know, inherently healthy, right? Um, and I don't want to, I want to make something quite clear here, right? Like, you know, if you're attuned to the physical activity or, or behavioral literature, it doesn't surprise me that most behaviors when children attend school or maybe another structured setting are, are favorable. Uh, we have a decent amount of literature that shows that. The key point about the structured days hypothesis is that the whole 24-hour day is actually impacted by just the presence of this, uh, you know, having to go somewhere, so to speak. Because there's a lot of variety in how schools, you know, operate and, and provide environments for children, and not just schools, summer camps, right, after school programs, they all differ. But what we found, there's a large amount of evidence that shows that when children attend, on days they attend, these obesogenic behaviors here on the right-hand side are actually a lot more favorable. Because this day, operates directly and indirectly on these behaviors. Just the fact that they have to attend could dictate when they eat their meals, when they go to bed, right? So now we have sleep and meal timing being a little bit more consistent. There's intentional and unintentional opportunities for physical activity built into the day, both inside and outside of the school. Not to mention when children attend, right, these programs or places, right? These, their days are a little bit more segmented, right? They probably have a higher degree of supervision. Right, what they consume and or engage in is regulated. And this is operating on a consistent basis. This is not just, oh, they attend for a day and then they're off for a couple of days. This is a big part of their lives. And um, so that's really the, the nature of the structured days hypothesis. It's this inherent um, built-in structure that, you know, some it can differ from day to day, but it's always there, right? The, whether they, you know, what one school looks like versus another, is not up for debate. They do differ, of course, but the fact that there exists in and of itself provides behavioral benefit, which can um, lead to more favorable uh, weight uh, related outcomes. So what are the common threads, right, between COVID-19 and the structured days hypothesis? I'm gonna go through these here uh, by behavior, but like, you know, this, again, this doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist to figure it out, right? You shut all these places down, um, you're going to see a reduction in activity time, but it's both inside and outside of school, right? So activity time was reduced. They couldn't attend school and sport-related programs, right? There was no active commuting to school. Just what about light physical activity? All that light physical activity that's built into the day that we don't necessarily capture unless we're obviously doing a study or we don't think about, right? 
just the, the transitions during classroom time, going to and from school, as I mentioned, right? All these things, you're up a little bit earlier, so you're, get your, your, you're uh, increasing physical activity earlier in the day. And then maybe there's some after school um, programs and or activities that can, to, that can you know, get you that extra bump, so to speak. That was all ultimately removed when you don't have that built in structure. We saw an, uh, a, a huge rise in screen and media time, right? Children were spending more time at home. Maybe they were more unsupervised. This open ended period, right? Maybe they have several hours where they have to fill it with being more sedentary, right? Maybe some more media time. I know we do, um, you know, we had more virtual schooling, but we do have some convincing evidence I'm going to share later on that looked at non educational screen time, which um, tell, paints a really uh, compelling picture uh, around that. We know our sleep. Uh, timing shifted. That's what we saw come out of the literature, right? Children were going to bed later and wake, waking later. They were also sleeping longer, um, but around bedtimes, perhaps there was more leniency around rules afforded by parents. And again, we do. There are data out there that supports that. Parents, parents, you know, you don't have school to get for the next day or anywhere to attend. Okay, you can stay up a little bit later at night, right? And then you don't have to get up at a certain time. Um, now, the, the sleep duration can be beneficial for health, but there are plenty of studies uh, or, or a decent amount of studies that show that when you shift sleep timing and, and independent sleep duration, there is a negative effect on uh, weight-related outcomes also. Diet and nutrition, country to country, continent to continent, was, was impacted um, culturally, right? There was some issue with um, some macro products in China getting to families, so they're the staples in their diet were completely um, thrown upside down. I know here in the US, um, a large portion of children get their meals at schools, right? So that was completely eliminated, obviously, and their, their, their access to these free and subsidized meals. So there's a large increase in food insecurity. I'm sure, sure some of you have seen some of the uh, literature coming out on that. But we also saw parents reporting higher amounts of snacking and caloric dense foods. Right, and also purchasing, right? We have to forget this was a pandemic. Um, we didn't know, you know, supply chain issues, perhaps they're stocking up on more shelf stable foods. This was an issue that um, faced all families, right? So perhaps the, the diet shifted. And again, there, were, there was evidence uh, of this coming out of the literature. What I'm sharing with you now, as I kind of gave you the, the I mentioned earlier, is this is hot off the, I was going to say hot off the press, but it's not, it's not in press yet, so it's not hot, hot off the press, maybe hot off the stats program, right? But I was fortunate enough for um, Dr. Michael Beats at the University of South Carolina, who's the head of the ACOI, the Arnold Childhood Obesity Initiative. He has some very compelling data that will be out soon uh, in manuscript form, where, you know, you have 700 kids. And these are, this is a within subject data that you're looking at, physical activity and screen time estimates. These 700 kids, so, so a large sample size, thousands of observation days, right? Risk placed accelerometry, 24 hour wear protocol. So, you know, all the, the gold standard stuff here. Um, this is just weekdays, right? So Monday through Friday. And the unique and interesting and compelling story about this is that this is the same 14 day period, okay? So you have children, the same child on one day will go to in-person school. That very next day, they may go to virtual. They may be at home for virtual school. And the next day in person, and the next day virtual, and then maybe they'll have a day off, right? So they were on this staggered calendar during COVID. And what we can see quite here, uh, quite clearly here on the left for MVPA, uh, in person is blue, virtual is orange, right? We see this shift in MVPA on days, or this large difference in MVPA on days, much less MVPA on days, I should say, um, for children who attend school um, virtually, right? And then on that next day, when that child attends in person, they're, they're getting considerably higher amounts of MEPA, right? And then we saw this trend, K through fifth, where the magnitude of the difference by grade was getting larger and larger as these kids were getting, uh, as, each, as you look at each individual grade, right? So I mean, we saw the same for screen time. I should say the dashed line is the screen time and the physical activity recommendations. Right, and you can see for screen time that the, the difference is here at least twofold. Uh, you know, just eyeballing it, maybe three or fourfold at this point. Let me see something. From, yeah, about three or fourfold. But again, on days that children attended school, okay, screen time is non educational screen time. So parents were reporting non educational screen time, so home screen time. 
was was considerably higher on virtual days compared to in-person days. Um, and and there's a they've got some really interesting data that they'll be sharing. They'll look at the other uh, some other behaviors too, sedentary time and uh, sleep. Uh, but I wasn't going to steal all of the thunder today. But this this is um, this is honestly uh, honestly one of the most compelling uh, sets of data that we've seen based on the fact that it's the same kid and on different days they're doing different schedules, uh, virtual versus in person, which really gives some more mileage to the, the operating mechanisms underpinned by the structured days hypothesis. So to kind of you know kind of bring this all together, so to speak, I, you know a common thread I think of what we've identified during COVID uh, uh, and, and what ultimately um, the structured days hypothesis tries to you know get across is that this removal from this consistency had this detrimental impact. But you know it was actually the prolonged period that it was removed that's probably caused um, some of these really um, startling, um, you could say, uh, you know, weight issues that we've seen during COVID and these um, uh, negative health behaviors. You know, it's like a, a never-ending summer, right, or a prolonged summer. Summer's three months here, it, it, it stops, we see accelerate weight gain occur over summer, but this was much longer than three months. Um, so I like to think of it as, as a prolonged period of time. What are the implications of this? Well, you know, as I've sort of been mentioning during this presentation, you know, we took these strategies to um, curb the spread of the, uh, the virus, obviously. Um, but at the same time, we took something away from children, right? We took away their daily structure. And, and I think I think the message out of that is that that's quite important for children. We have enough evidence now to, to say to see uh, and to say, like, this is this is a big this is a big deal when you do this. Um, so really, we just need to be considering these things when we start looking at, you know, developing interventions um, that want to look at childhood obesity. Like, when are, when are we trying to do these studies? Is it during a time of year or during a time when they need it the most? You know, just some sort, you know, especially when it's looking at the prevention and treatment of obesity in youth, right? It's just a, something to, to consider. Um, within the confines of COVID-19, and I, I did get asked this, you know, by some parents and, and during you know over the last two years like well what, what can we do about it like what you know what if we have another pandemic or what if this pandemic gets to the point again where we're shutting everything down what lessons have we learned well i mean it's easier said than done but can you try and create some sort of structure routine at home for your child it doesn't have to be perfect you know we, we you know we don't need in-depth curriculum day in day out but can you create segments to your day that might keep them on a natural or at least on a consistent cycle especially around meal timing, sleep timing. Can you get, can we get some activity in, right? Or maybe it's just a purposeful segment of the day where it's like, okay, this is your time, but you're only, you can choose how you want to use it. You can get a little bit of screen time, but then we're done, right? Um, so mimicking school-like segments could be a, a good strategy. Um, obviously, there's a, there's multiple ways. This good um, conceptual model here from Ashley Cali and colleagues that came out with, you know, Broadly, how do you prevent obesity and behaviors? I mean, it's essentially everything, right? Everything in the, uh, anything that you can sim think of, but, you know, structured routine is down there in the bottom left. And I think the importance of that is really beginning to come through um, in some of our, our data that, we, that we're, we're, uh, we're, we're looking at and working with on a day-to-day -day basis, but also in other studies that don't necessarily think, aren't, aren't necessarily thinking about structure, right? They're seeing this as a common, important mechanism. I, did, I, I want to finish off by uh, stating that there are some opportunities for future research in this area. Right? There, there is, uh, you know, there was a, a bias towards uh, data from um, middle to high income countries, right? So there was, we need to obviously explore some of the impact on these lower income countries. What about the longitudinal impact, right, of the pandemic on behaviors? I saw a great paper out of uh, Ross Jago's group um showing that physical activity levels now i guess if we're, we're kind of you know, i don't want to say we're out of the pandemic but physical activity now levels now are lower than when they were before the pandemic and they're they're conceptualizing that you know you know how has physical activity been pegged back right will we ever return to normal levels even though school's back right children are not as active now so is this a longer lasting impact of the pandemic right and then obviously this relationship between um, physical health and, and mental health. Mental health, I think, is 
you know, for you know, children, young adults, old adults, you know, the, yeah, across the board was severely impacted by the pandemic. So what's the relationship between there and is there, you know, can, can structure and routine be woven into that mechanism? So just some things to think about and um, thank you for listening to my spiel. I'm at the University of Central Florida. Um, come on down for a visit anytime you'd like. And um, I will uh, look forward to some questions at the end of the, uh, the webinar. I'm going to pass on now to my colleague, Leanne. All right. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I think he gave a, a really nice overview of uh, kind of a, a framework uh, and one that I, I used in uh, this this recent work that came out. Um, I'll be presenting today on behalf of um, my co-authors um, and I'll be presenting on two of the obesogenic behaviors that Keith mentioned, uh, physical activity and sedentary behavior. And um, so we'll be looking at uh, changes in these behaviors among school-aged children during COVID-19. Next slide, please. So as Keith mentioned, there is a lot of evidence um, on children's physical activity and sedentary behavior during COVID-19. Uh, a lot of these studies were cross-sectional um, or use self-report measures of these two behaviors. Um, and the studies that have come out using uh, device measure physical activity, a lot of them were uh, outside of the US um, or in very young children. So. Um, we were in a uh, kind of a unique opportunity to address some of these gaps. Next slide, please. So the aims of uh, the study that I'll be presenting on today uh, were to identify the change trajectories of device measured physical activity and sedentary time from pre-COVID to during COVID in school-aged children in the US. Um, additionally, we are interested in, you know, what are some of the uh, the factors that may be influencing these change and uh, are we seeing disparities? Next slide, please. So to accomplish these aims, uh, we used a pre-existing cohort of school-aged children, age eight to 11 years, who were enrolled in the STREET study. And the STREET study uh, is a natural experiment uh, that is evaluating the effects of safe routes to school infrastructure on child physical activity and active commuting to school. But with school closures during COVID, uh, during the 2020 and 2021 school year, uh, children, uh, you know, because they were at home, weren't active commuting to school or commuting to school at all. So, uh, so we pivoted a little bit um, and utilized the pre-existing relationships that we had with the families enrolled in the study. Um, and we were able to do contactless and mailing data collection with participants. So. Uh, the study has uh, two time points. Um, the first in kind of the pre-COVID, um, the data were collected between September 2019 and February 2020. And then in time two, uh, we followed up with all participants uh, and collected data. This is what we're kind of calling our COVID time point um, between October 2020 and March 2021. Uh, we aimed to kind of get this same, uh, you know, general time period for both uh, both time points to account for seasonality. Uh, here in Texas, summer months are very hot. And obviously, um, as Keith mentioned, um, you know, summer months are very different, um, you know, kind of environment and setting for the kids. So we wanted to be consistent with our timing of the measurements. Next slide, please. So children uh, wore accelerometers, um, as shown here in this picture, we used waist-worn accelerometers and the children wore them for seven days. Um, and our two main outcomes uh, that we used were mean daily minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity or MVPA and uh, mean daily hours of sedentary behavior. Uh, we used uh, parent surveys at baseline to assess some of the uh, kind of socio-ecological characteristics. Um, and these are, you know, factors from the individual level all the way up to the neighborhood level. Next slide, please. So these are some of the factors that we uh, took into consideration. Uh, we used some of the previous evidence on uh, physical activity uh, during COVID, as well as uh, general correlates of physical activity um, for these factors. At the individual level, uh, we looked at child age, 
gender and race, race ethnicity. Uh, at the family level, we looked at parental education attainment, number of children in the household, as well as independent mobility. So whether uh, children were allowed to walk and play without an adult uh, present. At the social and organizational level, we looked at school attendance during COVID uh, because this was the 2020 to 2021 school year here in Texas. Um, there was the option for in-person or virtual. Uh, and we also looked at informal social control and social cohesion, uh, as well as perceptions of uh, crime and traffic. And then at the built environment level, um, we looked at sidewalk availability and crosswalk availability. Next slide, please. So we to look at changes over time of movement behaviors, we use latent class linear mixed models. Uh, and this technique allows for uh, classification of change over time in uh, populations where there might be kind of unobserved groupings. Uh, in the figure shown here, there are uh, three different groups of change shown. Um, and without using the uh, you know, kind of the change trajectory, um, you know, this would look like just one group um, and it would kind of mask the true trends in the data. Uh, so we used this um, in order to see, you know, whether all children were decreasing or whether there were different groups um, that, um, you know, we, we didn't know ahead of time. So, uh, so we had separate models for both MVPA and sedentary time. Uh, and then once we uh, kind of determined the groups, uh, we used logistic regression to examine the association between uh, some of those um, socioecological factors and the changes in each movement behavior. Next slide, please. So we had 168 children that had valid physical activity at both time points. Uh, we had slightly more uh, girls and boys, uh, and their average age was about nine years old at baseline. So here in the U.S., these were children who were in third and fourth grade at baseline. Uh, the sample was diverse in terms of race ethnicity, uh, with 56% of the sample um, were not white, Caucasian, non-Hispanic. Uh, approximately one third of the sample had um, achieved high school or less education levels. Uh, and it was approximately equal in terms of school attendance with 47%, uh, sorry, 46% uh, in person and 54% uh, were virtual at home. Uh, the median change in uh, daily physical activity was about 10 minutes per day uh, decrease and the median change in sedentary time was um, an increase um, of about uh, 50 minutes per day. Uh, but as the next slides will show, uh, the averages in these two outcomes are not representative of all children. And, uh, you know, the strength of the methods that we use is that we're able to uh, kind of discern the trends over time in uh, these different groups. So uh, this slide shows the uh, two groups that we found for physical activity. Uh, so the majority of the participants uh, were in the decrease physical activity group, uh, which is shown in the purple line here. Uh, and among this group, the average change in physical activity was a decrease of 11 minutes from pre-COVID to during COVID. Uh, and as you can see, at pre uh, Pre-COVID, uh, they were only getting about uh, 42 minutes per day of physical activity, which is already below the uh, recommended guidelines of 60 minutes per day. Uh, and then this group decreased even further um, and during COVID only had an average of 30 minutes per day of uh, MVPA. Uh, this is in stark contrast to the uh, group in yellow, um, which had about 30 participants, um, and we called this the maintain high physical activity group. Um, and in this group, uh, you can see the uh, they remained uh, pretty constant in terms of their physical activity from pre-COVID to during COVID. Um, and what we found very striking was uh, during COVID, this uh, group in yellow, the maintain high, uh, had over double 
the amount of physical activity that the decrease physical activity group had. Um, so, you know, uh, there were already, uh, you know, a disparity and this increased even further during COVID. Next slide or next button. Thanks. Uh, oh, go back one for me. Thanks. Uh, so there were two significant socio-ecological characteristics that were um, associated with um, kids being in, in one of these two groups. Um, the first is gender, and boys were significantly more likely to be in this maintain high physical activity group than girls were. So girls were much more likely to decrease physical activity. And the second is social cohesion. So um, feelings of uh, trust and shared values among people in their neighborhood. And children living in neighborhoods with high social cohesion uh, were more likely to be in this maintain high physical activity group. So uh, in neighborhoods where um, parents felt like they could trust their neighbors, uh, the kids were getting more physical activity. Next slide, please. This slide is showing the changes in sedentary behavior. So um, for this, uh, for sedentary time, we saw three groups emerge from the data. Um, the first is uh, what we called a, mod a moderate increase of sedentary time. Uh, and this was the majority of participants, uh, which is shown in the purple line here. Um, and among this group, the uh, average increase in sedentary time was about one hour per day increase. Uh, the second group that we saw was what we called a steep increase of sedentary time, and um, this had 10 participants, but um, among this group, shown here in kind of the teal color, uh, the average change in sedentary time was almost three and a half hours per day. Uh, so um, going from about seven hours to 10 and a half hours per day of sedentary time. And the final group uh, shown here in yellow um, is kind of the, the favorable group. So this is the group that actually decreased sedentary time uh, during COVID. Um, and this group had uh, 26 participants. Um, and among this group, um, they, there was a, about an average of 45 minutes per day decrease in physical activity. Next bullet point, thanks. Uh, and for sedentary time, we there were uh, two important socioecological characteristics that were associated with these different changes. Um, the first is social cohesion again, um, but interestingly, we found uh, an inverse relationship with kind of the uh, with social cohesion and this kind of favorable uh, obesogenic behavior. So for sedentary time, children living in neighborhoods with low social cohesion were actually more likely to decrease sedentary time. So um, whereas with physical activity, kids living in high neighborhoods with high social cohesion um, were in kind of that favorable behavior group, here we're seeing the opposite. And secondly, uh, race ethnicity was an important characteristic and Hispanic children were more likely to be uh, in that decreased sedentary group compared to their white non-Hispanic counterpoints. Next slide, please. So overall, the study found significant declines in physical activity and increases in sedentary time, which is, uh, as Keith mentioned, pretty consistent um, across age groups and you know, geographic um, settings. Um, previous evidence of kind of changes over time in physical activity uh, the in you know kind of non-covid times the uh, relative change in daily minutes of physical activity um, is about three and a half percent per year uh, because physical activity declines um, as children age. Uh, this study found um, a relative change of about 17 percent so uh, indicating that the short-term uh, decline in activity levels were much higher than would be expected without the influence of COVID-19. And consistent with previous literature, um, girls were more likely to decrease physical activity um, than boys, uh, you know, showing that there is uh, a need to kind of counteract um, and, you know, really highlight the importance of physical activity and interventions among girls. Um, and 
the study also um, found that Hispanic children were likely to decrease sedentary behavior. Um, and some of the reasons for this that uh, we posit are um, the Hispanic children in our study were more likely to uh, be attending school in person um, than virtual compared to um, other racial ethnic groups. Um, additionally, there's uh, actually a, a colleague of mine uh, had mentioned that, you know, growing up, he's Hispanic and mentioned that he um, always had, you know, kind of family and cousins around. So there were other uh, kids to, to play with. Um, and so this is another reason why we might be seeing this. And finally, um, the study also highlights the importance of social cohesion and those kind of social influences on health. Um, one thing that, you know, I think COVID highlighted for everyone was um, the importance of social connectivity um, and that sense of, you know, counteracting the social isolation. So uh, it, with physical activity, we saw that um, you know, higher social cohesion was associated with high levels of physical activity. And parents may be more willing to allow their children to play outside, play with other children, or, you know, travel distances independently. Uh, which, you know, and then when sedentary behavior, we see, you know, kind of the opposite. Um, so um, with a lower perception of neighborhood social cohesions, parents may not allow their children to play outside, which results in more time spent inside. Um, and previous research has shown that, you know, a higher proportion of light physical activity is done indoors. So, you know, if parents uh, aren't, don't feel safe in their neighborhood or, you know, they don't, uh, there's not that kind of social cohesion, um, the kids might be spending more time indoors um, and replacing sedentary time with light physical activity like games or, uh, you know, online videos, dancing, uh, those types of things. Uh, so overall, this study really highlights the need to, you know, kind of counteract these short-term negative changes. Uh, and as Keith mentioned, you know, we, as more research comes out about, you know, whether these trends will persist um, or whether, you know, physical activity and sedentary behavior uh, levels will return to pre-COVID, um, you know, I think more research will will need to come out. but. Um, you know, I think that uh, overall, you know, there will be more of these kind of societal level disruptors that will happen. And uh, so, you know, I think that uh, these types of studies can be really important in, um, you know, highlighting the disparities that may exist. Next slide, please. And then I'd also just like to acknowledge um, the co-authors on this paper, as well as um, the study staff and all of the school districts, campuses, and participants that have been involved in it. Um, this study has been published um, and the QR code um, up on the screen will uh, take you to the paper if you're interested in reading more. Um, but otherwise, um, looking forward to uh, any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you both uh, for your presentations. We're going to go ahead. Some questions have started to um, compile in the chat. We do have some time for additional questions. So if you have any more, please put those in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Keith, I do have one while we have some questions coming in. You yeah. briefly mentioned um, Dr. Uh, Beats' study at South Carolina where you were showing MVPA and screen time. I know you, mm -hmm. you, you highlighted a little bit about sleep. Were those gaps, do you know, I don't know if you've seen any of that data, were those gaps, gaps as persistent between in virtual and in person as we saw with the screen time? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did get to have a little look at the sleep data. Um, duration differed, if I remember rightly, um, so Dr. Beats will, will, will correct me at a later date. Um, duration differed, duration was longer on invert, uh, virtual days compared to in person and sleep timing had shifted later. So kind of what we saw in some of the other evidence coming out of the, the pandemic period of time. Um, so, you know, which really shows day-to-day -day variability, because remember it's that 14 day period um, of assessment. So one, you know, if you look at collectively virtual nights versus in-person nights, um, you saw this variation day-to-day. -day. Uh, I could be completely misquoting the data, but 
that's that's to the best of my memory what what was occurring, um, which you know aligns, like I said, with the, with the evidence that has come out, um, and the mechanism driving that, which we do have some some data on, and I know um, Michael Beats and his colleagues presented some SVM regarding uh, rules and, and, and um, regulations around you know sleep and, and stuff in the home is that it, it tends to be a bit more lax right over summer compared to school months so maybe we're seeing that same mechanism right uh, you know nothing to attend the next day the next day is a virtual day but you know you, you can get to your tasks around 10 or 11 so everything just kind of goes out the window or is at least reduced right so I would, I would, I would see, I would think that those same mechanisms were in operation around rules and routines. Okay. Yeah. And then someone did ask about the data I presented. Uh, again, talking about sleep, uh, it said, "Does the data contain information on other chronic illnesses uh, that children with sleep disruption may have? Uh, maybe uncontrolled asthma or sleep apnea? I know that we do ask about asthma uh, within the Texas Span survey." Uh, I'm not sure uh, currently about sleep apnea. But that's something we could explore too. Uh, but we do have a nice uh, data explorer. If you just, uh, if it, for this person, you can look at the Texas Span data explorer to look at all those variables. And then, uh, particularly for collaboration, you could reach out to our our, our head uh, folks on the Texas Spans. We could further explore that. Then, um, Leanne, there's one question here. It's kind of broad. Uh, anything surprising uh, pop out about your study? I know that this was a primary study that you were collecting or have collected in Austin. So anything surprisingly pop out in analysis or, or discussion in the in the uh, article is published? I think one thing that, uh, you know, surprised us a little bit was, um, you know, the, uh, the physical activity trajectories. We had done some qualitative work where we were interviewing parents and children um, and asking them about their kind of physical activity um, during COVID. And, you know, we did hear from some that, uh, you know, they were walking more and, you know, and it, in these, uh, you know, kind of closed streets, you know, there are some, you um, interventions that were happening, uh, you know, kind of natural experiments, if you will, that, you know, where people were, um, you know, able to walk more in the neighborhood. So we were seeing that there were, you know, some kids that maybe weren't decreasing as much as others. And so, you know, that was kind of helped us to, to generate, um, you know, the hypothesis that, well, maybe not all kids are decreasing. So, um, you know, so then when we did see uh, those data where, you know, there was a, a group of kids that, you know, even they had high physical activity to start, but they maintained it. Um, so I think that was one thing that, you know, we uh, were, had thought might happen. And so then to kind of see that confirmed in the data, um, you know, I think was, uh, you know, slightly surprising because uh, I, I had thought that almost all would decrease physical activity. Seeing uh, another one here for, for you, Leanne. Did the neighborhood uh, built environment play a role in physical activity levels observed among the children? Uh, we didn't see a significant association between those kind of neighborhood uh, built environment uh, variables. However, they were, uh, you know, these were uh, just kind of two variables. You know, a lot of the kind of uh, socio-ecological characteristics, uh, you know, is pretty exploratory. Uh, you know, I think that um, there could be a lot more work on, um, you know, some of the other maybe park availability, uh, you know, and some of these other variables that might be really important for physical activity um, that, you know, we only looked at kind of the, the sidewalk and crosswalk. So thinking about kind of some of those walkability uh, factors, but, um, you know, I think that there are uh, a lot more potential um, you know, factors in the built environment that, um, you know, may play a role that we didn't explore in this study. Okay. And I see there's one more in our chat here. It's for uh, Dr. Ganser again. Well, any time diary information collected to tell us what kids did each day while wearing the accelerometer? Uh, we didn't have uh, any kind of time uh, diary for the accelerometer. Um, we do, we did collect um, in the survey, we have kind of a self-report um, physical activity measures that kind of correspond with 
the week of data collection. Um, but you know, we I think that type of context um, would be really interesting to look at. Uh, you know, because I think that. Um, Kind of comparing the you know the time of day um, would be really interesting um, for this study we you know we're kind of looking at the broad trends but especially now with the results of the study i think that that would be a, a really interesting next step of seeing you know at, at what points of the day are kids getting physical activity you know pre-covid compared to during covid okay um, another one came in for for you, Leanne. So, was was whether or not the kids had siblings taken in, into account uh, for the data in, this, in your study? Uh, it was. Yeah, we included we um, from the parent survey. We had um, data that asked a question that asked about um, the number of children living in the household, uh, and so we did include that um, as um, a factor in, in some of our models. But um, we didn't see a significant association. Um, which, you know, I, that's something that I uh, kind of expected, you know, and, and thought that, that we might see that. Um, but um, at least in this sample, um, we didn't see uh, an association. Okay. And again, Leanne's study is published, correct? So we could yes. find that study. <clears throat> okay, Keith, did you have anything to, or were, I don't have any more questions coming in, but if you didn't have anything else to add. <clears throat> Yeah, I was thinking there about, you know, if I didn't have the, the screen share going on, I could have looked at the, some of the data that the, the ACOI group had shared with me. Mm -hmm. um, but I do remember that, you know, children who um, attended school in person for, four, for that 14 day, over that 14 day period, on days they attended in person versus virtual, looking at the 24 hour movement behavior guidelines, they were more likely to meet um, the guidelines across the three behaviors on days they attended in person versus not. So taking into account, you know, physical activity, sleep and sedentary time uh, mm -hmm. and the movement behavior uh, analyses. So that was, um, that was interesting. Another interesting finding. Okay. Well, with that, um, it does look like we've covered all of our questions. I'm sure you could reach out privately to uh, Dr. Ganser or Brazendale for any additional questions. Um, thank you all for attending today's webinar. We appreciate you being here. Remember, the webinar will be archived on the Michael and Susan Dell Center website at msdcenter.org. Thanks again for joining us today, and we will see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.